Whenever you bet, bet Fred. This is Andy Pirua for Boxing Social. I'm now delighted to be joined by Josh Buatzi. Mr. Steel, your girl is out tonight. <laughs> How are you doing, Josh? I'm cool, thank you, man. I'm alright, thanks. Mr. Steel, your girlfriend's finally out. Finally got a haircut, hydrated, eating, so I feel good, man. How you doing? I'm all good, thank you. You know, this ritual of yours, what, what is, I say ritual, but this, I don't know, is it a superstition or is it just something that you're showing, like, the work you go through in camp? and you're just staying focused and then on the night before you just want to show everybody that you're looking sharp and at your best, ready to put on a sharp and your best display on a Saturday night? Um, I think what it is is that um, during camp, what I, what I kind of focus on is training. Um, I don't think about a lot of things and I'm quite selfish in that way. What I'm thinking about is getting the work in, making sure I'm fit and that I come in shape. So getting a haircut is really not on the radar. And um, when it's time to box, you know, I come out, cut the hair, feel good, look good, whatever it is, I come out and I perform. Um, but today, though, I was saying to one of my boys that I'm going to have to change it up. I need to start getting these frequent haircuts to remind <laughs> myself of how, of how handsome I am, to remind people as well of how handsome I am. Um, some people like the rough look, though, do you know what I mean? Some people don't, but um, I was thinking to just start getting haircuts more frequently. But um, that's not 100% yet. So how often are you getting your hair cut when you're in camp? Um, I actually don't cut my hair when I'm in camp at all now. So I, ha I haven't had a haircut for about eight to nine weeks and um, this was my first one. So it's a good feeling, it feels good. Um, and this year and last year, the only times I've cut my hair was before the fight. So um, I need to, maybe I need to change up, I don't know. Let me know what you think, people. I couldn't do that, Josh. I'll get mine every week, so. <laughs> oh, that, that often, yeah? Yeah, that cool, often. Man, cool, man. But well, we're just going to pick up on that as well. We saw AJ go out last time without a haircut, so has he yeah. taken a note from your book then, I take it? He might be taking a leaf out of the book, but he went the extra mile though, because he actually didn't cut his hair um, till after the fight. That I wouldn't do. I, I almost felt I got a step in the ring, feeling fresh and looking fresh, man. But um, a few people are doing it. I see you. I'm not going <laughs> to pull them up, but I see you. Well, we are here to talk about your fight on Saturday night, Tony Avalanche. Obviously, we'll come to the comparisons that you spoke about earlier with Anthony Yards and that, which are just natural for everybody just to look at on paper. But why now have you decided to get in with Tony? Um, I wouldn't say I chose to fight him. The team chose to fight him. Um, he accepted the challenge, fair play to him, and um, that's who I have to deal with. Um, like you said, it's inevitable that people make the comparison between myself and Yard as to how we both dealt with him, or deal with him, should I say. Um, and that's natural. But like I always say to myself, um, and I'll say it before the fight, if I get rid of him before seven, fantastic. If I get rid of him after, after seven, it's still fantastic. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm not gonna wait and then get rid of him before seven and be like, yeah, on the top ropes, shouting, going mad, thinking, yeah, I did better than Yard. Nah, different styles, different fights. So as um, long as I get the win, and I perform well and I dominate him, I'm happy with that. You just mentioned you don't tend to have um, a say in like, the picking your opponents, your team picks them out for you. So what type of involvement do you have from that side? My involvement comes in the sense that there'll be um, a few opponents presented to the team and um, you know they'll be like, well, actually, these are the options. And I always say to my trainers, listen, you pick, I don't really care, pick who you think will benefit me at this stage of my career and I'm more than happy to go with it. But just for confirmation and just for um, accountability, they like to say, Bwetsi, okay, we think here's the guy, you know, what do you think? Yeah or no? But more time I'm like, listen, pick him and I'll get in there. So what do you know about Tony and have you watched his fight with Anthony? So his fight with Yard, I watched the first round. Um, I watched also the first run with him and another German fighter. I can't remember the name, to be honest. And um, that's about it. I've kind of got an idea of how he fights. Um, not reading too much into it because, again, there were different stars in front of him. And that's how he dealt with it. So my trainers, they've watched him and I'm sure they will come up with a game plan and how to execute it. And also, for myself, I'll work it out while I'm in the ring. So um, that's really the approach that I take on most of these fights. Um, I've spoken to a few different boxers about this and this question I'm about to ask you now is this expectation of building around the Olympians and yourself you know you're going in with someone like I said who's been with Anthony Yard who's got expectation building around himself 
How do you manage it? How does Anthony Fowler, Lawrence Ocoli, who's just picked up a British title in only his 10th fight, you know, Josh Kelly, how do you all manage that expectation of eventually these guys are going to be world champions one day, no matter what? Yeah. That's what some people think without actually acknowledging the sport and how difficult it will be to get there. Um, how do we deal with that? Do, do you know what it is? It's part, it's part of the parcel. Um, yeah, when you win, people praise you. If you don't win, they'll probably... Um, curse you or stuff like that but I understand it's part of the game um, I don't look for appraisal from people that's the thing about me so I don't look for that so I say to myself why should I also then listen to the critique to the critics and to the negative comments that people have to say so um, the pressure is there there's always pressure in, in whatever you do and to whatever scale that you do it at depend, depending on how far you want to go so I understand there's pressure in that but um, end of the day I'm going to get in the ring I'm going to have this fight with Tony so whether I put pressure on myself now or before or after or during it makes no difference um, the pressure is there but again that, my greatest pressure to be fair with you is what I'm putting on myself that's my greatest pressure and, and what I always remember is that I step in that ring not anyone else so to an extent you have to block out everything around you and concentrate and and speak your own mind and, and listen to yourself and do what you have to do. So that, that's pretty much how I see it. Um, how the other Olympians deal with it, probably different to myself or probably similar, I, I'm, I'm not too sure, but we deal with it. Every fighter deals with it, so I don't really want to separate um, the Olympians and myself from all the other crop of fighters because we all deal with pressure. Um, and I 100% respect every, everyone, anyone that steps in that ring take my hat off to them, fully respect them. Um, so credit to everyone, man. One thing that I've noticed about you, and I'm just listening to you speak then, is not only are you very humble, but you're very respectful. When, when like, you're doing your heads-to-heads your head -head and you're staring into your opponent's face, it's very much shake your hand at the end. You go separate ways, you fight, shake your hand at the end again. Would there ever be a scenario where say if you get in a ring with someone and there's maybe been some messages over social media he's sent your way or vice versa I don't know but would it ever be a situation where you may turn around and show a different side like a, not necessarily to the extremes of Wilder Fury for example but where you might just show a little bit of he's got under my skin a bit or you just want to tell him like you know back off um, the, the, the thing is like we're all fighters and, and res respect costs nothing. It's nice to be nice to people and people to be nice to you. Um, so I think, will I disrespect someone? I wouldn't, but I wouldn't let anyone disrespect me. And if they did, um, that would just make the beating in the ring a lot more painful for them. Um, do the talking with the hands, as they say, do you know what I mean? So I wouldn't, it'd be out of character for me to do something like that. But if it does happen, I'm only human, just like Khabib said in the UFC, the most humblest guy from what I can see, and I fully respect him, but he felt McGregor stepped out of line, and what he did to McGregor's team after the fight, he says, listen man, the guy's disrespect, disrespecting my family, my religion, my parents, I stepped out of line, so what? He said, I'm only human, and that's what people have to remember, like, I'm respectful, I'm polite, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, yeah, but let's remember, I'm still human. If someone disrespects me or they step out of line, there's a way to handle it, there's a way to deal with it. And I will, I will deal with it and I will find that way. Um, but the best way is to do it in the ring. It's, it's pretty straightforward. But I, I feel you're waiting for me to bite on someone. <laughs> no, I'm not. I was, just, I was literally about to say, you're human with a sharp fade. I was waiting to yeah, get that in there. Yeah. <laughs> but let's talk about Saturday night then. What type of fight do you expect it to be? Um, so looking at Tony... Um, he looks like he's a hungry fighter right now. And what I say is that he's lost to a brick before in his last fight and he's coming back now. So he's coming back even hungrier than ever. He wants to beat a brick. Do you know what I mean? Um, he's, he lost here on his last outing. So he's going to come to kind of try and set the record straight. So he's going to come hungry. He, he looks hungry. He looks like, you know, he wants to win. So um, it, it's going to be someone that's going to try... Um, that's going to be trying to win and obviously I'm in there to win as well so um, it, it sets up for a good fight and um, again um, I think it'll, it, it's meant to be a step up fight um, but again I, I'm treating this as an opponent he's more experienced he's won a lot of things but again it's an opponent to me and 
my job is to go out there and to deal with it and to make it look easy. You've just said your job is to go out there, make it look easy if, if you can. Do you feel an added pressure because of the yard links and the fact that Anthony Yard beat uh, Tony, that you have to try and, not necessarily better him, but you have to at least match his performance? Back, back to the same answer, I feel that if I get rid of him before seven, good. If I don't, good. The aim is to win. It, it, it's, it's, this, this, this person has been chosen at this particular stage of my career and it's for me to benefit from it, to learn from it and to move on to it. So um, is there going to be pressure yet? Yeah, that, that thought is there because I'm like, ah, oh, everyone's thinking it, but it's not right at the front of my thoughts. That nah, my, my, my thoughts right now is to win at all costs um, and to make it look good. So if it comes before seven, good. If it doesn't, good. If it's a points win, good. Whatever it is, I'm taking the win. So that, that's what really matters to me most importantly. I just want to ask you as well about the atmosphere that everybody's continued to talk about for Newcastle. How, how do you feel that you'll be able to deal with it? Because it seems to be, it's just going to be like a cauldron. Everybody like, on top of you shouting, 9,000 fans, it's going to be unreal. And I can imagine it actually be it's feeling for a fighter, noisier than what going out at Wembley would be like because it's so clo close and enclosed. Um, I, think, I think it will be good. That brings the best out of me. I, I like it when it's like that. Whether the crowd is for you or against you, as long as there's noise and it's loud, you know, all eyes are watching and, and the anticipation is very high. I, I, I like things like that. So I think it'll be good. I'm, I've heard a lot about it, like you said. So I hope the fans don't let us down and I hope the atmosphere is as good as they say and we, the boxers, will make sure we put on a show. Except for the Olympics and the major amateur you know, tournaments that you have where you can travel around the world and everybody comes out to watch, how different is it to the smaller tournaments when you might travel out to Hungary or Kazakhstan, like the current GB squad do? How different is it? It's a big difference, you know. Um, I've, people might think, oh, he's having it easy boxing on these nice big shows, but I've boxed it on the smaller shows. I've boxed in these countries that you've mentioned where there's about three to six people in the crowd. Um, you're boxing a very good kid, but there's no audience. And I've been there, I've done that. And... Um, it's different, you know, but it's still the fight, you know, it's still someone trying to hurt you and you make sure you get him before he gets you. So I think the crowd there, like I said, I'm gonna, it's good, I'm going to enjoy it, I'm going to embrace it. That's all I can do. Um, I can't be like, oh yeah, actually can 8,000 of you get out, I only want 1,000 in, I can't do that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So um, it's, it's not an issue for me at, at all, if I'm honest with you. Uh, talk to me about the rest of the card as well, you know, uh, Davis versus Foot. Yeah. Ritson again stepping up in a European title fight now versus yeah. Patera and obviously your boy Anthony Fowler from GB, yeah. Dave Allen coming back. You know, talk to me about the rest of the card. So we've got the Sandman himself, Lewis Ritson, headlining the show. Um, and like I said before, I was curious what the Sandman meant. So I googled it, found out it's someone that puts people to sleep and he's been doing a lot of that. So um, that nickname fully matches him. And I'm still searching for a nickname. I'm not going to call myself anything obvious like the Beast or the Bomber Mr. or... Nah, <laughs> Mr. Nah, Mr. Steel Girl is just saying that, listen, I've got a haircut, I'm looking handsome, I'm feeling handsome, as anyone should. Don't feel that you're ugly or not pretty or whatever. You should always feel that you're the best person. I went to a show at the O2 Arena, yeah? There was about... How, how, how many seats are there in the O2 Arena? About 20,000. And I said to my mate, listen, this seat that I'm sitting on, 190, is the most important seat in this whole arena. And that's the mentality people need to have. They need to believe that they're as important as anyone else. Just because someone's got a medal, if they're related to the queen, if they're related to the president, whatever it is, you need to recognise that you're as important as them. Value is an important thing. So for me, I said to my mate, I said, listen, there's a lot of seats here. But I believe 190, what I'm sitting on, is the most important seat in here. And I said to my mate, you should think your seat is the most important one too. And you should believe that seat that you're sitting on is the most important seat in Newcastle right now. We're in Newcastle. You have to believe that's the most important seat. Do you know what I mean? But um, So, yes, the Sandman is headlining. Dave Allen, funniest ever. Um, catching a lot of jokes from him. Do you know what I mean? Um, and, and, and I like his approach on these fights. He's very relaxed. Um, and also... Glenn Foote and the uh, and Davis Jr. Ah, oh, that they they made my day yesterday because the banter between the pair of them was really really good. Um, Fowler just came back from Chicago, um, the machine, hungry as ever, 
and then also we have Joe Laws who's um, sold a thousand tickets, nearly a thousand tickets. Hats off to him, man. Um, if he was here, I would say, listen, Joe, have this seat. I'm going to stand for you, man. So um, hats off to him. Um, it's a great show. There, there's some fighters that I haven't mentioned, but um, I'll be watching as well, man. It's an exciting card. I'm looking forward to it. So people tune in, support the boys, and again, bring out your popcorns and just enjoy the show. Now, the dreaded comparisons that I just wanted to come on to, you know, with, with Anthony. Yeah. Taking this fight, do you feel that maybe it puts a bit of pressure onto his team to maybe consider it more likely to happen in the near future than maybe down the line, which seems to be the way it's been weighed up, that it might happen a bit further down the line than closer to what maybe fans would like to see or more people in boxing would like to see? Um, again, I feel... Do you know what it is? I, I can't comment on what him or his team are doing because it's their journey. That's the most important thing. I'm doing my journey here. They're doing their journey. So I think for me to sit here and to be like, oh, they should be doing this, they should be doing this, doing that, so that we can fight is wrong. Um, I'm sure it'll come to a point where one of us has a title, the other person will be mandatory or the, the public will become impatient and will be offered the right amount of money to fight each other and it will happen. So... Um, it, it would be wrong for me to be like, oh yeah, they should do this, they should do that, they should be doing this. Um, it's by no means a strategic move that I've decided to fight um, Tony or the team has chosen me to fight Tony just because he boxed yard. No, it's of no strategic move, but it's a good opponent. Right now at this stage of my career, they feel it's the right move. So that's the fight that I'm taking. So um, I can't comment on his team and what they're doing. I'm sure they, they feel they're doing the right things and they're moving the right way. Do you see this fight then with Anthony 100% happening at some point in your careers, regardless of whether either of you have picked up losses or anything wrong happens in your career? That maybe isn't a part of the plan. Um, I'd like to think so. You know, I'd, I'd like to think that the public are mega, mega interested. And I think the, the more, as time goes on, I think the whole nation will be actually more interested. And um, it sets out for a great fight. Um, Again, there are different paths that we both might take, but if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But for, for me, I just think, you know, it's, it's, it's a fight that people want to see. And as boxers, we want to entertain people. So I'm sure at the right time, both teams will come together. And when it has to be done, it will be done. Um, again, I can't tell the future or give time skills or talk on his behalf or anything. So... If it, ha if it happens, it happens, do you know what I mean? Just wanted to ask as well, obviously he's promoted by Frank Warren, you're by Eddie Hearn. Yeah. Do you feel that the cross-promotion might make it a bit more difficult to make the fight at some point? Um, I wanted to say yeah, but I think I've heard Eddie say that, listen, we'll come to BT Sport if we have to. Um, speaking to Eddie, he's very eager to make the fight happen as soon as possible, so... Um, I don't think that will be an issue. Um, it shouldn't be, because I'm sure fighters from different promoters have fought each other before, so um, it shouldn't be. You've obviously got, you've got some big names in your division, some big hitters. You know, we just saw Baturbiev and Johnson. Yeah. You know, just talking about some of the guys, obviously Bivol as well, uh, Kovalev. But start with Baturbiev and Johnson. Did you watch that fight and what did you make of it? Um, so that fight, I woke up just after it had finished. So um, I was kind of half asleep watching it. I've been meaning to watch it, but because I'm boxing soon, I can't, I'm kind of concentrating on what I'm doing. Um, but hats off to Callum Johnson. He went, he went out there, he gave it everything, put the man down. Um, the guy recovered like a true champion, came back and did the job. So hats off to the pair of them. Um, there's some killers internationally in my weight category. But I also think nationally there's some good fights available. Um, it's a division with a, I think it's one of the strongest division in the world, nationally and internationally. So I think, I think that there are fights available. It's just a matter of timing, where and when they can happen. Um, and I'm sure each, each one of us would fight each other, but there, there are a lot of factors that have to be considered. When I first turned pro, I thought, ah, oh, if you want to fight Bob, you just call Bob out, or you and Bob agree to fight each other, and that's it. And to an extent, it can be as simple as that, but. You want to make sure you're getting paid the right money to fight Bob. That is the right time to fight Bob. There's a lot of things to consider. So I've, I've started to learn that it's not as straightforward as I thought it was. 
when uh, John's obviously knocking Baturbiev down, yeah. do you think that gives other people in the division confidence because Baturbiev was built as up as a monster who just couldn't be touched and then he gets knocked down? Do you think that gives others confidence that they don't need to be scared of him or fear him and they go in the ring and they could actually give him a better fight than what they probably fought beforehand? Um, again, it could do, but that was Johnson's style in front of him. And like I say, each fight is different. They have their own styles, what they're good at and what they're not good at. So you can't be like, oh, Johnson put him down, so I'm going to go in there and hope to put him down too. But what you can do is, you know, train yourself and make sure your style is effective against the other geezer's style. So, um, but yeah, people will watch and think, actually, we thought this guy was a monster and he went down. But like I said, he got up like a champion and finished the job. So can you fault him there? I don't think so. Now, just moving away from the light heavy division, and there's just a few other topics going on in boxing. I mean, I just wanted to get your opinion on. Yeah. Um, start off with uh, Amir Khan and Cal Brook. Rumours that 147's been agreed, but yeah. Amir Khan wants a £10 rehydration limit um, put in. What are your thoughts on that? Um, it's a bit of a tricky one. It's like, yeah, 147 will fight at that, and that's it, period. Or 147, but I don't want you to balloon after that. But it's like actually agree the weight, make the weight, and then after that, let the fight happen. No clause, no this, no that. But again, safety is important as well. But it's like once you've made the weight, you've made the weight, innit? Like, let it be. But um, I'm not in their position, man. They, they're, they're, they're in the positions that they're in. They've achieved what they've achieved. So I don't think my little opinion and my little experience will will benefit them in, in the sense of telling them what to do or what the best thing is. Um, maybe in a few years' time, once I've been there and done that myself, I can talk about it. But I feel right now I'm not necessarily in any position to, t to tell former world champions what to do. They've been there and they've done that. They've achieved something that I haven't achieved before. So like you, you have to stay in your lane and, and know what to do, man. I read an article earlier this week that apparently the WBC are looking to introduce an on-the-night um, weight check. What are your thoughts with regards to that, that IBF do the £10 in the morning of the fight? Because they're trying to obviously make sure fighters are fighting at more of a natural weight yeah. to reduce the risk of people you know, yeah. cutting down to make the, a weight below or something and putting themselves in danger. Do you think it could be... And more of a risk because fighters might try even harder to cut down to a lower, a lower weight. That's a good point. I never considered that it could be more of a risk because fighters then would even work extremely harder to get the weight off. But um, initially I thought, oh, that's good. Then I thought the reality is no one fights at their natural weight. That's really, really the reality. Um, and then I thought, OK, it's good. But they're talking about doing it on the night of the fight. The IBF does the morning, like you said, but the night of the fight, that's quite tense, man, because we've all eaten and we're ready to go. So, um, I mean, you can a, imagine if it's a unification where you got the IBF in the morning. Wow, the wow, the wow. It's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. But um, so what I wanted to know is that if you're if you don't make the way, what happens? You're fined and then the fight still carries on. I presume the fight would carry on, but you wouldn't be able to win the belt. I presume that would be the... Oh, wow. So you'd only be able to be won by the one person who makes a weight. Yeah, I, I think they've got some serious thinking to do, man. But it's good to see that all round are these um, sanctions are thinking of health, which is the most important thing. Just speaking on health, and I can tell you're going to give me a, a, an answer, which I'm going to really enjoy listening to now. In boxing, it seems to be there isn't a great deal of support for mental health. Mm -hmm. So when boxers retire, we're seeing them, you know, they struggle to find what to do themselves. So say any sport, you know, footballers when they retire, they don't know what to do with themselves because you've spent your entire career dedicated to one thing and it's all you know. You know what you don't know what you're gonna do with your time after that. Do you feel that there's enough support for boxers from a mental health perspective to make sure that they don't fall down any bad routes and, and especially after seeing what's happened with Toys and Fury over these past few years, you know, do you feel there's there's enough in place for boxers? Um, it's a hard one because I haven't Experience. Yeah, I haven't experienced this, so it's quite hard to comment. But what I do know is that, like, boxing is important. But I always say to myself, it's not, it's not life. Life is more important. Like being healthy, family, living a good, nice life is important. So, um, so I watched the thing um, when 
Cotto was fighting Margarito, and when they did the face-off, this is the second fight, Margarito was like, listen, I'm willing to die in there. And Cotto was like, I'm not. Like, I'm not willing to die in there. Cotto was like, if I die in there, who's going to look after my wife, my kids? And Cotto was like, this guy's stupid to say that. But what I do say to people is that, listen, boxing's a dangerous sport, but we train hard to learn to protect ourselves properly and to be fit and to get through the rounds and to make sure you get them before they get you. So um, would, can I say that, is there enough um, things in place to help this mental health awareness? I'm not too sure. Um, for the fact that I haven't got to the end of my career yet, um, and, there's n and no one knows when the career is going to end, that's the thing about it, but I think just staying prepared and knowing that boxing isn't everything. I say that, but at the same time, boxing is what I do every day. Do you know what I mean? But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really hard balance. But you need to balance, you know, like life and boxing as well. So, um, so it's a hard one to be fair with you. What are your thoughts? Because you're asking me all the questions. Let's see what you think. What do you think about it? I've got, um, look, I've had a family member who took his life suffering from depression. Wow, so, so yeah, wow. thank you. And um, it was actually last month, it was six years ago wow. Wow. Uh, to the day. So I have a, probably a deep connection with it and I understand yeah. more about it. From what I've seen in boxing and I've written my dissertation on it, um, wow. there's nowhere near enough, in my opinion, yeah. Uh, yeah. for boxers for when they retire. Yeah. You know, when you. Probably I'd argue the same with football, the difference being with football, they have organisations where they expect you to call them. In reality, it should be they should be reaching yeah, yeah, out to you. Yeah, yeah. I do feel more needs to be done for boxing, but you know, unfortunately I'm not involved in that it's area. A hard so. one. And I feel it's a hard one because if someone's going through something, the best thing that they're good at doing is not showing it. So I think it's hard for an organisation to think, oh, yeah, we think I'm going to use Bob again. I don't know why, why Bob's popping up. But it's hard for an organisation to sit down and think, oh, we think Bob's depressed. Let's ring Bob. You're not going to know. Social media is fake. Half of the things I put up, like, you don't read too deep into it. It's only social media. It's only Instagram. Half of the things that I am doing, it's not up there. So you can't sit down and think, oh, he looks happy. She doesn't look happy. Oh, let's contact them. So it's quite hard. I think it's hard for these things in place to reach out to people. I think the best thing to do is to just let people know that it's available. So as um, long as people know it's available, then they, they know how to reach out. But again, it's not that straightforward. But um, anyone that is suffering, going through something, just speak to someone. Just just open up and just talk to anyone. And you see me, I, lo I love to talk to strangers because like they say, you don't know what they're going through. And I'm always talking rubbish to people. I might, I, I might just see you and be like, ah, oh, my man, I like your top and just keep walking. It's not that deep, but you might think, ah, oh, he likes the top that I'm wearing. Like, and you might smile and get on with your day, but it's a little compliment. It doesn't cost anything. Is it hard then, you know, when, when you put something up on, on Instagram or Twitter and you said everybody might look at it and think, oh, look at where he is, look at what he's doing, but they don't see you in camp, they don't see the three, four sessions a day. Is it, is it a bit frustrating at times that people don't see that and just think that you're living this million dollar lifestyle when in reality you're locked away from your family for months on end yeah. doing the same thing over and over again you can't really enjoy yourself yeah um i wouldn't say it's frustrating but i just think that i'm like oh they don't understand they might see a picture and think oh works is living a good life but i'm like bruh do you know what we were doing for weeks and weeks and weeks so um but it, do you know it is every boxer is doing the same thing so I can't sit down and just single myself out and be like, yeah, have pity on me. No, I, can't, I couldn't do that. But um, it's part of it again. Like people will not see what you're doing, but you know that you're putting in that work. So for me, that's good enough. So if you see me somewhere nice, sunny and hot, yeah, I might be there for a week or two or a few days, but I've worked to be there. I've had to put in hours and hours and hours and hours to be there. Um, I, I, the thing about me is I don't just treat myself if I don't feel I deserve it. So if I've been working, working hard and I'm somewhere nice, please believe I worked for it. Just to move on from this now on to another topic I wanted to ask you about was the Billy Joe Saunders um, situation. Obviously he's vacated his belt. It seemed likely he was going to eventually yeah. be stripped. Um, he wasn't given a licence to fight Demetrius Andrade in, uh, at the end of October. 
What was your thoughts on that situation? Did you, do you think that was a fair punishment? Um, to be fair, I was looking forward to the fight myself. So um, I don't know the ins and outs of it. So I don't know whether he actually failed a test or... So he failed with VADA uh, for a nasal spray, which contains something you're not allowed. But okay. it's not in competition, right? That's in competition as the day before, I think. Yeah. And it's also the drug that he failed on wasn't on the UCAD list, I believe, yeah. or the WADA list. So see, it's a very touchy yeah. subject and it's a bit of a grey area. So I, like, I have to sit on the fence for this one. It's really hard to comment on because like, was it in competition? Was it out of competition? If one country says no, nope, it's illegal, and one country says it's legal, it's like, it's yeah, do you know what I mean? It's a, it's a bit of a grey area, to be fair. He was done for uh, a nasal spray. So is it that easy in boxing where something as simple as that, you wouldn't even assume there was an issue? Um, I was speaking to Anthony Fowler yesterday, he was telling me at GB you couldn't have lemsip. No, no. So, you know, is it that easy that you could have something as simple as that just to help yourself out and he's got something and you're not allowed? Absolutely, it's that simple and we're, we're educated on it but even that is really simple because if you're ill you're going to think ah oh, let me get a LEMSIP but I heard LEMSIP is banned during competition perhaps maybe out of competition I'm not too sure but to save myself I just don't take it that's, that's the thing so I don't know the ins and the outs I just stay away from supplements um, and that's as safe as I can be if I'm not sure about something I just wouldn't take it um, but like you said some, some things you might think oh that's solely innocent you're taking it with a clear head and then you find out that oh it's illegal so for me I just I just stay away from them so when retirement comes lem sip every night <laughs> hopefully not because I don't want to be ill but if ever I do feel a bit rough straight down to Tesco's Express get my <laughs> lem sip and that's me done and the final thing I just wanted to ask you on was um Rumours of uh, Dillian White's next appointment looking at December 22nd, either Derek Chisora, Luis Ortiz or Dominic Brazil. For you, what would you like to see happen? Um, that's for Dillian and his team. But what I do want to say about Dillian is that hats off to him. I, I And I keep saying this to people. I say, like, someone took an L to Josh and the way he's bounced back, I haven't seen that before. I haven't seen it happen. So hats off to him every, every time, man. Um, boxed Parker, I was there, I boxed on, the, on, on that show, came back, showered, watched it, and I thought, listen, man, salute to this guy. And, and that's all I have to say based on Dylan White, man. Salute to him, respect what he's doing. And, and uh, yeah, I don't want to say any more, but big, up, big, big him up, man. What he's doing, I respect that, man, big time. Well, Joshua Bawatsi, Mr. Steal Your Girl, thank ah. you so much for speaking <laughs> to Boxing Social. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much, man. Everyone, stay tuned in. My man here is working hard, man. We've got more and more interviews for you. Big up. Whenever you bet, bet Fred.